first of all, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming in. Uh, folks joining us from Phoenix online, welcome. So it is an absolute pleasure to have Dr. Rice. Uh, Dr. Rice is a professor of medicine from Vanderbilt. Uh, he is well-renowned nationally, internationally, ex and extensively published particularly in the spheres of sepsis and nutrition. So it's, uh, it's an absolute honor to welcome him and have him in uh, Omaha to talk to us uh, today at Grand Rounds and then again tomorrow uh, to our division. So questions uh, will be at the end. Uh, just write them down or, and I'll, I'll probably have him hang out a little bit after the talk too. So if you guys want to hang out and talk to him after that. But otherwise, Dr. Rice. We're going to talk about sepsis and specifically fluids in sepsis and two big parts of fluids in sepsis. One is how do we fluid resuscitate patients in sepsis? And then what should we be using to fluid resuscitate patients? First things first, conflicts of interest. So the biggest conflicts of interest you'll see from me are intellectual. Uh, I will actually talk about studies that I actually was part of. I helped design. That doesn't mean you can't critique them. You should critique them all you want. Um, but you should know that I may have a bias when I talk about those studies. And I may view them in a different lens than somebody who wasn't part of that whole process, specifically clovers that we'll talk about early on. And then the smart trial uh, that we'll talk about near the end. Both of those were funded by the NIH. So that's the funding disclosure here. And then I'm a consultant for a couple of companies, none of which do anything in fluids and they won't have anything to do with this talk, but in full transparency, uh, those, are, those are the disclosures. So here's what we're gonna do. We'll discuss uh, data behind fluid resuscitation in patients, septic patients, so specifically in septic shock. Then we'll talk about recent data on liberal versus conservative fluid management, sort of in the later phases, phases of the res resuscitation uh, after that initial fluid resuscitation. Then we'll talk a little bit about balance versus uh, saline crystalloids and some of the work that we've done there. And then hopefully I'll leave you with an impression that timing probably matters on what fluid you give. And so balanced fluids early may be different than balanced fluids late. And I'll show you some data that hopefully will make you agree with me in that regard. No good grand rounds is without a case. So here's your case. 55 year old male has nephrolithiasis, comes in with fever, fevers and right flank pain. Uh, he has an obstructing stone at the level of the ureteropelvic junction, he has right hydronephrosis, uh, he, at my institution, would go to interventional radiology. There's actually a fight between urology and interventional radiology. Usually interventional radiology loses, so they usually take the patient and put in a perk neph tube. Occasionally my urologist will, and occasionally my urologist will put in a stent. Yeah, was but at my place, he probably gets a perk neph tube by interventional radiology. Uh, and then, this isn't uncommon, shortly after that, the interventional radiologist calls me and says, this guy doesn't look very good. He's got fever, his blood pressure is not very good. He's breathing really fast. Um, do you have an ICU bed? So because of hypotension, we take him to the ICU. He gets up here pretty quickly uh, from my interventional radiology suite. And the nurse says, Dr. Rice, what do you want to do with fluids in this gentleman? How do you want to treat him? So that'll be the basis for the, for the talk. So first, how much and when to stop? As far as I can tell, uh, and there's a little digging involved here, but maybe not fully. Uh, this all started in 1832. So in 1832, this is an actual report of a lady that presented with cholera. Uh, and as far as I can tell from the medical literature is the first report of using intravenous fluids in a patient uh, with cholera. Uh, she began to breathe less laboriously. The pulse, which had long ceased, returned to the wrist. In a short space of half an hour, she expressed in a firm voice that she was free from all uneasiness, actually became jocular, and fancied all she needed was a little sleep, which I think may be true today too. We were, all we need is a little bit of sleep. Um, this was considered a huge success because they gave it to four patients and this lady survived, the other three died. Um, but one out of four they thought was pretty good, 25% survival rate in 1832 with cholera, uh, they thought was pretty good. Then we get to surviving sepsis campaign guidelines. And I'm gonna show you uh, a little bit of 2012, 2016, and then the most recent version in 2021 throughout this talk. This one you can see 2012 to 2016, they say changes, but in reality, it's the same recommendation. And that recommendation is 30 mils per kilo of IV crystalloid uh, as the initial resuscitation fluid in the first three hours. 
they added in 2016 this, you should use dynamic measures in order to figure out if you should give more. We'll talk about that briefly. I won't go into each of the dynamic measures, but we'll talk about dynamic measures and using them in general when we talk about the classic trial. Uh, and then lastly, um, I'll give you the, I'll show you the study that made them say, you can use normalization of the lactate uh, as a effective surrogate for if the patient is resuscitated or not. Many of you uh, may not be old enough to know this study, but this was sort of a breakthrough study in this area. Manny Rivers, uh, early goal directed therapy in 2001 published in the New England Journal. They took patients, all of them at his hospital in Detroit, 250, 260 of them, sorry, uh, either had to have shock or a lactate above four. And if you read the manuscript, over half of them actually didn't have shock. They just had a lactate above four as their septic shock criteria. They ran them through this protocol and they were randomized to either standard care, which was whatever the hospital was doing, which isn't well described, unfortunately, or this early goal directed therapy where they tried to direct fluid to a CVP, pressors to a MAP, and then uh, packed red blood cells into butamine to this catheter that they used, a special catheter, central venous catheter, and a mixed venous saturation of 70%. Uh, and their outcome was 28-day mortality. What did they find? They found a huge difference in 28-day mortality, 16% absolute difference in 28-day mortality by using the early goal-directed therapy route. That was true for patients at hospital discharge and true for 60 days out. And this sort of became the new paradigm and the new standard of care with one big question, which was, did we have to use the catheter or could you just do the whole algorithm without, without trying to use the catheter? It turned out that if you did the early goal-directed therapy uh, treatment, the patients got more fluids in the first six hours. That's what brings us this urgency of giving 30 mils per kilo in the first three hours. They ended up with lower severity of illness scores over time, lower lactates over time, and less need for subsequent mechanical ventilation. Uh, Alan Jones actually then took that and said, do we have to use the catheter or can we use lactates? This is the study that makes the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines say it's okay to use lactates instead of this catheter. And what they showed in these 300 patients was that if you used a 10% reduction in lactate as the same as an SVO2 sat above 70%, you got similar results. It was a non-inferior approach. So you could use resolving of your resol resolution of your lactate as a surrogate that you had a high enough SVO2. Um, and that worked in this trial. There were still lots of questions about this. And so Process, Arise, and Promise are three studies that tried to replicate Manny Rivers' early goal-directed therapy. What you should know, and you'll see this with Process, is, is that care had changed during this time. So the usual care arm in these trials is almost assuredly different than the usual care arm that Manny Rivers had in his initial early goal-directed therapy arm. But they tried to use this and see, do we all need to buy this special catheter? This was open label. Uh, about 1,300 patients, same inclusion criteria, 60-day mortality was the primary outcome. And here's what happened. Top left is, did you get the special catheter? It occurred in the arm that was randomized to the special catheter. It did not occur in the other two arms, which was protocolized fluid management. And then the third arm was wild type. Doctors got to do, or practitioners got to do what they wanted. Um, you can see in the top right, uh, if you got the SVO2 catheter, it got measured. Otherwise, it didn't get measured. So just in the one arm. C, the panel C, bottom left, I think is instructive. That's fluid administration over time. The top line is actually the protocolized strategy, not with the catheter, but protocolized without the catheter. The middle line is uh, protocolized, kind of the flatter one is protocolized with the catheter. And the bottom line is usual care. And the reason I put this up is because I think you'll see usual care here is a little bit different than the two other arms, but not that different because care off of Manny Rivers' study had already changed usual care a fair amount during this time period. Um, and you could see there was a little bit of use of packed red blood cells and dobutamine more when driven by the catheter than in the other arms. You can spend a lot of time looking at this, but I'll tell you there's no difference in any of these outcomes for any of the three arms. So the catheter at least doesn't appear to have made the difference. Uh, it's a little bit hard to know if early goal directed therapy made a difference because, as I said, the usual care arm had moved closer to that during this trial uh, anyway. Promise and Arise I put together. They're, uh, one of them's from Europe and one of them's from uh, Australia. 
And they essentially did the same thing, except they didn't have this standardized fluid resuscitation arm. They just did early goal directed therapy or usual care. Uh, they also found that early goal directed therapy gave more fluid, more red cells, more dobutamine in the first six hours, but no differences in any 90 day mortality, hospital mortality, length of stay, organ support. Uh, they did actually see a difference in SOFA scores and length of stay, but it actually favored usual care and not early goal directed therapy. And if you go, well, what about subgroups of patients? Because the early goal directed therapy, my interviewers, they don't show you subgroups. Promise doesn't show you subgroups. Arise does a nice job of showing you subgroups. And there's not any subgroup that looked like early goal directed therapy was beneficial. Again, recognizing that usual care had changed a little bit at this point. So where are we now? This is 2021, still a recommendation that uh, you give 30 mils per kilo of IV crystalloid within the first three hours. They actually downgraded the recommendation from 2016. In 2016, they said it was a strong recommendation with low quality of evidence. Now they say there's still low quality of evidence. It's based off of one trial essentially that showed a difference, uh, but they give it a less strong recommendation, a weaker recommendation, but still in the camp, uh, guidelines. And probably something we need to study a little bit further if we can. Uh, for adults with septic shock, they su still suggest dynamic measures. Again, we'll talk about those. And then um, serum lactate's okay. And I didn't go through Andromeda shock, which is a study from South America, but Andromeda shock actually shows that you can use capillary refill also to do your fluid resuscitation uh, as, a, as a means of whether or not you have adequate fluid resuscitation. So that's included in the newest guidance. All right, so that's the front part. But then the real part is this patient oftentimes in, the, in, my, in my house gets 30 mils per kilo or close to it in the emergency department. And then they come to me and they're still in shock. And the question is, hey, do you want to give them the fluid? Uh, or should we go up in their presence? Or do you want to do something else? So how do we know when to stop? And the 2021 guidelines essentially say, we don't, we don't know. We don't know whether uh, restrictive versus liberal strategies are better. Uh, and we need more information in this realm. Fortunately, and they knew this, there were two trials that actually are informative in this area. One is classic from Northern Europe, 1,500 patients had septic shock. In order to be eligible, you had to have already gotten a liter of fluid. So it's not the same patients that Manny Rivers studied. It's a little bit later in their disease course than the uh, first, first presentation in the emergency department. Randomization actually occurred in the ICU, which I think is important to know in this trial. Open label, you either had restrictive fluids, and you can see here the four reasons that you could get fluids. I love the one that says, you haven't gotten a liter yet today, so I should give you fluids. Like a liter is some magical number that we all had to have in a day, but that was, that was uh, one of them. And then the standard arm let the clinicians do whatever they wanted. And most of these clinicians that participated actually did dynamic measures of fluid resuscitation. That was allowed in the standard arm. So you could do a passive leg raise, or you could do uh, how the IVC uh, changes with inspiration. All of those were allowed and used for most of the patients in the standard arm. Primary outcome was 90-day mortality. Uh, here you can actually see what was given in the two arms. Uh, and it turns out that in the first hour, it's about a liter mean in the restrictive arm and not quite two, 1.7 liters in the standard fluid group. If you go through five days, it's like two and a half versus three and a half, almost four. Um, and if you go all the way, I guess it's in the middle, total fluid volume, that includes enteral feeds, that includes things with IV meds, that includes all of that. You can see these patients at five days in the restrictive group got 9.6 liters of fluid, it's still a lot of fluid. In the, in the liberal group, they got 11.2. So more in the liberal group, but it's kind of like more in the restrictive group and more plus in the liberal group. Uh, so they get a fair amount of fluid. And you guys know this, there was no difference in death at 90 days. And in fact, no difference in any of the outcomes that they looked at um, from an organ failure standpoint, from the restrictive versus the conservative. Here's their Kaplan-Meier curve. They actually get a little separation, not enough to be statistically significant, but it's not what we call the purple line where the red and the blue are on top of each other and it's purple. Um, the bottom is their, is their um, subgroups. And there's this provocative subgroup about whether you have respiratory support and if you're on it, maybe conservative is better. And if you're not, maybe liberal is better. I won't show it to you in clovers, but we looked at it in clovers and it goes the opposite way, which suggests that it's probably a spurious finding. And I wouldn't believe that it's real if we can't replicate it. 
All right, Clovers. Clovers is a trial that I participated in the design of and then enrolled patients in. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. How big that grain is, you can decide, but take it with a grain of salt. 2,200 patients planned. We got a little over 1,500, and the DSMB said, You're not, neither of these arms is going to win. You should stop. Um, the two arms are what I call fluid first or vasopressor first. We wanted to call them fluid and vasopressor restrictive and liberal, but it turns out that they're not exclusively fluids or exclusively vasopressors. And I'll show you that on the next slide. Uh, in order to get into this trial, you had to essentially be resuscitated in an emergency department. So the criteria were you had to have between one and three liters of fluid already given to you in order to be eligible. Again, this is not repeating Manny Rivers trial because these patients are already getting this pseudo 30 mils per kilo of IV fluids before they're even eligible. Um, there are options for rescue fluids in the presser's arm and rescue pressers in the fluids arm. And I'll show you those on the next slide. Uh, and then if you have questions at the end, I'm happy to talk about the, the complaint by public citizen. Uh, but there was a complaint, full disclosure, early on in the trial that it wasn't an ethical trial and that we were randomizing patients to two extremes that nobody ever used, uh, and therefore it was unethical. It was looked at. Uh, it was slowed down in enrollment. Uh, there were a couple changes made to make sure that you could use rescues and that people would use rescue if they wanted to, and then it, it went on. Here, you're not going to be able to read this, and that's okay. The important part of this is, is that the left side is uh, the restrictive fluid group, so that's pressors prioritized. The right side is fluid prioritized, and you can see in the bottom, there's a uh, out for you get to go to usual practice. That's if the patient's not doing very well, has severe signs of ischemia. And in the bottom right of both of these, there's the rescue side where you get to use whatever you're not randomized to, to rescue the patient. So if you're randomized in the pressors first group, there are outs for this patient should get fluids um, or at least should try and get fluids. Similarly, if you're in the fluids first group, there are outs for you should probably at least start pressors if not go up on pressors in this group. So that's why I think it's better to think of it as prioritizing fluids versus prioritizing pressors instead of a pure split between the two arms. Here are the, the main characteristics and the things I'll point out are these. Almost all of the patients were enrolled in the emergency department. So they didn't wait until they actually got to an ICU before they were enrolled. Almost all of them were enrolled in the emergency department. And if you look, in general, they have about two liters of fluid in before they start the study procedures. So they've already gotten two liters of fluid. They've already kind of gotten this early goal-directed therapy. 30 C we don't have any 70 kilo people, at least in Middle Tennessee. That's a unicorn, right? The 70 kilo, I was telling Mark a little earlier, uh, I can't even find that at my pediatric hospital now as a 70 kilo person. Um, so two liters isn't exactly 30 mils per kilo, but it's essentially that concept of 30 mils per kilo of crystalloid resuscitation. Here's what they got on the course of the study. There's not a huge difference here, but there are differences. So on the top in the first six hours, it's about a half a liter versus two, 2.3 liters. If you look at the first 24 hours, which is the time that the protocol ran for, it's 1.2 versus 3.4 liters, so about two liters difference. There's more presser use in the presser arm. That's good. That means we did an actual trial. Both more patients that saw pressers and they got pressers for a longer period of time. But again, they're not exclusive. Here's your actual outcomes. There's no difference in our primary death before discharge at home by day 90. And then looking at a bunch of us secondary outcomes, there's no difference in organ failures or any of these secondary outcomes either. So where are we with fluid resuscitation? I think this is where we're at. Weak evidence suggests that initial early fluid resuscitation improves outcomes in patients that present you with septic shock. Once the patient makes it past that stage, like when they get to me in the ICU, both conservative and liberal fluid strategies seem to give us similar outcomes. So if you like pressors and you want to use pressors and not give the patient more fluids, have at it. If you're a guy who hates norepinephrine and wants to give fluids to try and get off the norepinephrine, this would suggest that within reasonable bounds for clovers, for example, if we gave you an additional five liters of fluid, then there was an out that maybe we should be using pressors after you've gotten essentially seven or eight liters of fluid. Um, but within reasonable bounds, fluids are also probably um, similar to outcomes to pressors. Uh, we talked about that. So that's the resuscitation part. Now the question is, 
I know how much I'm going to give and potentially how, how I'm going to stop. Does it matter what I give? Does what I give during that resuscitation actually matter in my septic patient? So there's some clear things here that matter. So this is head of starch, and I won't go through all these data, but I should have just written it in big letters, bad. Head of starch is bad, right? This is a, a landmark study that shows that head of starch actually hurt people. Higher mortality, more renal failure, uh, more severe bleeding. And, and then they did this, I love this by the way, they did a long-term follow-up on these patients. So if you were lucky enough to not die and not get your renal failure, then you ended up with itching, uh, this pruritus for your quality of life measures um, long-term. So bad, bad, maybe really bad. Uh, and I don't know if you guys in my career have actually never given head of starch to somebody. It's not on my formulary at the hospital. And I think the FDA may have actually put a black box warning on it or taken it off. Uh, so I don't think you can even get this. But this is good information because this is pretty clear. Don't use head of starch. What about albumin? Albumin, I think, is provocative. And it really, really makes me wonder. This is the SAFE study done in the early 2000s by the Australians. They call it saline instead of saline, but saline versus albumin. And they actually started this in the back of an ambulance, not just in patients with sepsis or septic shock, but in anybody who needed fluid resuscitation. And about 20% of them ended up with sepsis. 4% albumin versus saline, no difference in mortality overall, uh, trend toward a mortality benefit in sepsis. And I think I highlighted it here. Nope, I didn't. Um, you can see the kind of third grouping there. Severe sepsis, yes, in 1,200 patients. It looks like maybe albumin's a little bit better uh, in these patients. This, these, this actual figure made it so that if you're doing trauma, you don't give albumin to TBI patients, right? That's the trauma second part. And you can see albumin was worse in the patients that had trauma. And so it got taken out of the trauma algorithm. We didn't quite make that leap with sepsis, even though the data suggests that maybe albumin is a good resuscitation fluid in sepsis. Uh, we didn't quite make that leap yet. Then there was albios, which was done in Italy, looking at uh, albumin replacement patients with severe sepsis, septic shock. Big study, 1800 patients. Open label, you either got albumin plus crystalloid or just crystalloid until your target albumin was three grams per deciliter. So if you were below that, you got albumin. If you got up to three grams in the albumin arm, they stopped giving you albumin and just gave you crystalloid. And it happened the whole 28 days that you were in the ICU. 28 day mortality, not difference between the groups. Uh, 90 day mortality, MEC vents, renal failure, not different. But if you look at the group that has septic shock, which is this group down here, Septic shock, yes. When they resuscitated patients in this arm, you got resuscitated with whatever fluid you were randomized to. So these patients with septic shock got resuscitated with albumin, assuming their albumin was below three. And you can see what looks like a potential signal for albumin uh, benefit in this, in this group. Again, I think provocative, but not enough that's gonna make me stock albumin in the back of my ambulances or stock albumin in my ED and say, give them albumin first. Uh, but I think provocative in we need more information on this. So where are we with this? Here's your 2021 guidelines. Start at the bottom. Recommend against starches. I didn't show you the gelatins. It's not quite as bad with the gelatins as it is the starches, but it's similar. So no starches, no gelatins. What about albumin? So they kind of give us a nonsensical recommendation with albumin. It says, and I quote, for adults with sepsis or septic shock, we suggest using albumin in patients who receive large volumes of crystalloid. Perfect. Maybe at some place you should tell me what a large volume of crystalloid is. Like, is that three liters? Is that five liters? Is that uh, 30 mils per kilo? What is a large volume? They don't tell you anywhere in there uh, what it is. And I think this is them looking at those two albumin studies and saying, wow, we're really, really, really intrigued. Could albumin be beneficial in these patients? but the data just aren't quite definitive enough for us to make this firm recommendation to say, let's give albumin. And then lastly, they say, we recommend using crystalloids. And in 2021, they actually got off the fence and said, we recommend balanced crystalloids over saline. In 2016, they said either is okay. 2021, they said balanced. Why is that? Well, here are the data that I think suggests that you should use balanced crystalloids in your resuscitating your patients with septic shock. First things, IV fluid administration in the ICU, in the hospital is ubiquitous. 
these are US numbers, about 30 million patients in the US every year get IV fluids. And it's to the tune of about 200 million liters of IV fluids. So this is probably the most common treatment that we provide in the hospital. The ICU oxygen may actually be more common than this, but in the hospital, fluids is more common for sure. There are differences between the fluids. And here you can see the, the row, or I guess the column on the left is your actual plasma concentration. And then you've got saline, lactate ringers, and plasmolite. And specifically, if you look at chloride, saline is actually hyperchloremic to your plasma chloride and balanced and plasma light are very isochloremic, very, very similar. There are other uh, differences. For example, the lactated ringers and plasma light have <clears throat> some inorganic uh, acids in them, whether it's lactate or acetate and gluconate, depending on which one. Uh, there's a little bit of potassium, and we can talk about that at the end if you all uh, have questions about it. So we know it's commonly given to patients. Uh, they differ in electrolyte composition. We know that these differences may make at least some physiologic uh, differences in patients, uh, but we don't actually know, does it make a difference in outcomes? And this, we're talking about patients in general, not sepsis right now. We'll get to sepsis here shortly with this. What do we know about the physiologic changes? Saline definitely causes a metabolic acidosis, hyperchloremic, non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. It's been shown over and over and over again. Animal models, human models, uh, healthy volunteers, which are always medical students. They were medical students in these studies. Um, they showed it in all of those. There are good studies that show that saline causes renal vasoconstriction, uh, mostly in healthy volunteers, but no reason to believe it doesn't happen in, in people with illness also. It may actually result in acute kidney injury. There's a little bit of conflict here in some of the models, but uh, some concern that it might cause kidney injury. And then in observational data, there's a suggestion that saline may increase mortality although these are really, really confounded by volumes of fluid given uh, and differences in practice. So what about actual randomized trials that do this? The first one is called the split study done by Paul Young in Australia. And it looked at uh, balanced, which was plasma light versus saline in patients coming to the ICU. <clears throat> um, they, you couldn't have AKI or you couldn't have end-stage renal disease to be eligible. Uh, and they did it in alternating seven week blocks, clusters, alternating seven week blocks. Their primary endpoint was essentially renal failure. And you can see there's really no difference here in renal failure between the groups. The one pause I would give you is, is that most of these patients are post-op surgery patients. And when they told you a severity of illness score, they're not very sick, even though uh, they're in an ICU. All right, another intellectual conflict of interest. SMART was the next one. SMART is a trial that I'm the senior author on. So I helped run this trial, design this trial, et cetera. What did we do in SMART? So in SMART, we said, we're going to try and enroll as many patients as we can, as fast as we can in a pragmatic way. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to assign different ICUs to an actual default fluid for a month. You can see here the months. My, my hospital has subspecialty ICUs. So I have a medical ICU, a neuro ICU, cardiac ICU, a burn ICU, which didn't participate in this, a trauma ICU, and a, and a, a surgical ICU. And you can see the B are balanced months and the S are saline months. And we got, you got a cluster uh, allocation of the fluid that was being used in the ICU for that month. We actually paired it, not initially, but it took us seven months, but eventually we paired it with what fluid was available in either the emergency department or the operating room. And the ICU was paired with where they got most of their patients from. So in the medical ICU, most of my patients come from the ED. So we were paired with the ED. The surgical ICU, most of the patients actually come from the OR. So they're paired with the OR. Same with cardiovascular and neuro. Uh, most of their patients come from the OR, so they're paired with ORs. Uh, but we actually paired this. This will be important when we talk about first fluid given near the end here. There's your two fluids. Uh, how did we deliver this? So I was telling Nikhil and Mark, I was, we were lucky. The way this is set up in our hospital is that the fluid is in this machine called a Pixis. Do you guys have a Pixis or do you call it something else? You have a Pixis? Uh, in the Pixis, and it doesn't have a patient's name on it. So it's just sitting there. So in my ICU, if we are in a balanced fluid month, the only fluid available in the PICS was a balanced fluid, a balanced fluid. So when I walk into the room and the patient needs fluid and I say to the nurse, why don't you give this patient a liter of fluid? They go to the PICS, all they can get is the study fluid. If I want the patient to have the non-study fluid, I can order it and it'll come up from pharmacy, but the default is the study fluid. So we ended up, and I'll show you, we ended up with a little contamination, but not a lot 
because of the way we were able to do this. The cost of these fluids at my hospital is low enough that my hospital does not charge an individual patient for them. So they never get assigned to the actual patient. Uh, and that's what actually allowed us to do this. There was also a prompt that came up in the order set. If we were in a balanced fluid month and you ordered saline, this was the prompt that would say, you wanna order a balanced fluid, pick one or two. Does the patient have a real reason why you think they need saline, which were hyperkalemia or head injury, brain injury, or this always, my attending said so. This is sort of like mom and dad because I said so, right? Um, and you could pick one of those and then order saline. But the top two got you still compliant with whatever arm you were randomized to. We uh, actually have data. People pick hyperkalemia a lot with a potassium of 3.4. And you're like, come on, really? Like we, we had those data, we knew, but we didn't, we didn't push back on it in real time. Primary outcome was make 30, major adverse kidney events at 30 days. People thought we were crazy to use this, but it's an FDA approved outcome uh, developed by the nephrologists that they say has clinically relevant, three clinically relevant outcomes. Did the patient, the patients care about? Did the patient die? Did the patient get new dialysis? So if you came into the ICU and you're an end-stage renal patient and you're already on dialysis, you don't get credit for getting dialysis. You had to be a non-dialysis patient who we started dialysis on in the hospital in the ICU. Uh, and then did you leave the hospital with a creatinine that was twice your baseline? And the reason that the nephrologists at least think this is clinically relevant is because these patients get follow-up with nephrology. So it results in you getting a clinic visit with nephrology, follow-up, and that's what's Secondary outcomes are the individual components, uh, AKI by Cadigo criteria, and then all of the usual organ failure criteria, ICU, ventilator-free days, et cetera. So I said we were gonna enroll patients quickly. We enrolled 15,800 patients in about 20 months um, because every patient in the ICU was essentially enrolled. There are some patients, about 15% in our ICUs that actually didn't get fluid. Uh, which we thought was a bummer because we're not going to be able to see a signal on those. It turned out to be a little bit helpful for us because when we got the results, we said, mm, I don't know if I believe these results. What's the difference in the groups that didn't get any fluid? And if you look at that, and this is in slides at the end, if you want to see it, there's no difference in the 15% of the patients in make 30 that didn't get fluids, which is good as an internal control, because if there was a difference in those patients, then we had a problem with randomization and a problem with the way we did. So it, it provided us a nice internal control. Most of these, about a third of them are the medical ICU. And then you can see uh, second highest was our trauma, cardiovascular, neuro, and, and surgical was 1300. Here's what they look like. About 15% of them had sepsis. About a quarter of them are on pressors and about a third of them are on mechanical ventilation. So that's sort of the makeup of critically ill patients at my institution. About half of them are admitted from the emergency department. Oh, here's the fluid that they got. I told you that if your attending wanted it, or if you thought the potassium with 3.4 was hyperkalemia, you could choose the other fluid. So there is some other fluid that goes in, but you can see in general, the left side is balanced crystalloids. And over the course of seven days, they got two, two and a half liters on average of balanced crystalloids and about 500 cc's of saline uh, on average. So there's a little bit of a mix, but predominantly balanced. Very, very similar in the saline group. There's a little, little bit less balanced in the saline group. And that's because all of the IV fluid administration at my hospital at the time, at least, came in saline. So that was some background saline in both groups that goes into the compliant in the saline group and contaminant in the balance group. Here's your primary outcome, 14.3 versus 15.4%. So only a 1% difference. And we, as we got these results, got a new statistician into our group. And he said, Todd, why do we care? This is 1%. Like it's a tiny difference. Why do we care? Remember, the reason we care is because 30 million people a year get, get crystalloids. If this is real, 1% difference, 1% of 30 million people is 300,000 people a year in the US alone that we could be giving a make 30 outcome to because we gave them saline instead of balanced. It has, it has much less to do with the delta here than the number of patients that we're multiplying it across, for sure. And I think the other part of this is, is that if there was a difference of thousands of dollars in the cost of these, then you would have to think about it. In Brazil, there's a real difference in the cost. And when we talk to our Brazilian colleagues, they go, I don't know. I don't know if it's worth giving balanced fluids with all of the cost for this small of an effect. 
But in my hospital, one of these, and I can't remember which one, is $2.83 a bag, and one of them is $2.85 a bag. They're the same cost. So it's just which one you're picking uh, from the order set. What about the individual components? Here you can see they all favor balanced. None of them, individual components, is statistically significant by itself, which some people don't like. Secondary clinical outcomes, they're all very similar, except for RRT-free days. You get less RRT in balanced fluids. Uh, and here are your secondary renal outcomes, um, AKI, not quite statistically significant, but lower in the balanced fluid group. That's all comers. We'll talk about sepsis here in a minute. Here are your subgroups, and you can look at sepsis, but I'll blow it up and make it bigger uh, in a couple of slides. Well, maybe I'll do it now. And you say, okay, that's great. That was smart, and people got excited about smart, but the Brazilians did a trial called BASICS, and the Australians did a trial called PLUS that are very, very, very similar. They both used plasma light uh, instead of any balanced fluid, lactated ringers or plasma light uh, versus saline. They both had blinded trials. Our trial was open label, not blinded, so difference in the methodology. They both enroll patients as soon as they get to an ICU and not when they started in the emergency department like we had paired. And we'll talk about that a fair amount here in a couple of slides. Here's the Brazilians. Uh, again, about half of them have post-elective surgery, 20% with sepsis. Again, excluded anybody who was already on RRT or you knew was gonna get RRT in the near future. Uh, primary outcome, 90 days, mortality. Here's their Kaplan-Meier curve. Balanced is a little lower as you get out to 90 days, but not statistically significant. P-value is 0.47. Um, here's the actual uh, other outcomes, and you can see no difference in kidney outcomes, which are the bottom here uh, for basics. Here's their subgroup. Sepsis is the second subgroup. Yes is the bottom part of the second subgroup. Maybe slightly favors balanced uh, compared to saline, but not statistically significant. Plus, plus actually stopped early because it turned out the Australians were already on board with balanced fluids. So they had a hard time randomizing actually in PLUS. PLUS was supposed to go to 15,000 patients and it actually got stopped at 5,000 because they just were struggling to enroll. Uh, 75 Australian ICUs, again, enrolled in the ICU, not from the emergency department, double blind, uh, a higher incidence of sepsis, same primary outcome, 90 day mortality as basics. No difference in any of these, 90 days, any renal thing, any creatinine, ventilation, anything that you can look at, no difference. When you look at their subgroups, there's a sepsis subgroup. It's about spot on one for an odds ratio that you can get between the two groups. So there's your trials of balance versus saline uh, that I presented to you. I didn't present our pilot, similar salt, um, but the others are I presented to you. And it turns out that we all got together and said, we should put all of our data together and do a meta-analysis. Uh, and that's where we're actually moving. So Fernando Zampieri from Brazil has actually been leading this, but the Australians are involved. Matt Semler and I uh, are contributing data and are part of this. The concern that I have with basics and plus is they enrolled patients starting in the ICU and they don't enroll patients when they first get fluids. This is basics. And you can see here in basics, about 30% of the patients get balanced fluids before they get to the ICU and another 20% get saline before they get to the ICU. And on average, the median is about a liter. So a lot of people say they got a liter of fluid, doesn't really matter. I'll show you data from us that suggests that that first liter of fluid is probably the most important liter of fluid that we give. And it's prob it pains me to say this because I don't have control over it, but it's probably the most important liter of fluid that we give composition wise uh, in our patients. So remember our setup, our setup allows us to actually compare patients that were enrolled in that first seven months when we didn't have control of pre-ICU fluids with patients enrolled in the last 15 months where we did have uh, control. So instead of this traditional RCT, which is what basics and plus are, we have seven months of that top one and 15 months of the bottom. And Wes Self, brilliant as he was, said, maybe we should look at these different groups and see what the difference is. So on the left is the first seven months balanced versus saline. And you can see our signal entirely goes away. We have no benefit at all for balanced fluids when we didn't have control of what was occurring before they got to us in the ICU. The right-hand side is the 15 months after we had control. 
And you can see when you get balanced all the way through versus saline all the way through, the signal starts to emerge and you start to see the difference uh, in the groups. In general, in our trial, these patients got about a liter of fluid median, about a liter of fluid in the ED. These are the data that when I saw them, I said, oh man, this is unfortunate for us in the ICU because I think it means that that first liter of fluid is the really important liter of fluid. Fernando Zampieri were doing their trial when we came out with this. So they pre-planned the same analysis. And here's their analysis of not where they had control, but what the fluid was that was given. So the top is all of the patients. The second one is if you just got balanced fluids before you came to the ICU. The third is you got a mix of balanced and saline. The fourth is just saline. And then the fifth is, uh, no, sorry, the fourth is no fluids. And the fifth is saline only. And then depending on what you got before you came to the ICU, they compared balanced versus saline. So if you look at balanced only, if you got balanced fluids in the ICU, when you got balanced fluids only before you got to the ICU, you see a difference between balanced and saline. And they said, we're going to look at this in sepsis patients, unplanned. This was post-hoc. They didn't plan this on the front end. And you can see the effect is slightly exaggerated in sepsis patients, suggesting that balanced fluids are important uh, in this patient population on the front end, probably when you're given that 30 mils per kilo of crystalloid. Here's the meta-analysis or the, the uh, combination of all of our work together. This is all patients. And you can see there is this very small potential signal for balanced fluids in all comers in the ICU. This isn't sepsis, this is all comers. Um, but the signal's small. If it's there and it's real, which I believe it is, uh, it's a small signal. It's a 4% difference in mortality uh, overall, 4% relative difference in mortality overall, not absolute. Um, and it does cross one. So you can see the conclusion that we put in this New England Journal of Medicine evidence paper. It ranges someplace between a 9% relative reduction in mortality to a 1% increase uh, in mortality and the risk of death with a high probability that balanced crystalloids reduce mortality. It's nine, about a 90% probability using Bayesian principles. All right, let me explicitly show you sepsis data. So here's sepsis data. I blew up our sepsis. Here's sepsis from SMART, yes and no. You can see it's on the side of favors balanced. Here's basic, sepsis, yes or no. Kind of on the side of balance, but clearly crosses one. And then um, the meta-analysis for just sepsis, a bigger difference than all comers. So here it could be a 7% relative reduction in mortality, still crosses one, goes to 1.01. Um, the I'll show you the probability of benefit. It's again, about 90%, but I'll show it to you in a couple of slides. That first meta-analysis was just lumping everything together. Subsequently, we, we put all of our individual patient data together and we can do more granular analyses. This was just published in Lancet Respiratory Medicine a couple months ago. And here you can actually see sepsis at the, at the top part um, and we get a better estimate. The second to the right column, probability of benefit, that's the Bayesian analysis, which was the primary analysis of this, says about an 89.3% chance that balanced fluids are better than saline. This is mortality. Balanced fluids are better than saline in regards to mortality. Here are granular data from SMART, patients that came to my ICU with sepsis. All of these patients got lactated ringers. Some of the other ICUs use plasma light. We use lactated ringers. All these patients got lactated ringers. This is norepinephrine equivalence. If you look at patients with sepsis, came to my ICU, depending on the month, they got either saline or balanced fluids. And this is norepinephrine equivalence. And you can actually see that lactated ringers decreases your dependence on norepinephrine. This was a bit of a surprise to us. But if you go look at the anesthesia literature, this is reported in a number of anesthesia cases that when they give balanced fluids, they give less pressors or no need for pressors compared to when they give saline. I don't entirely understand what it is. Is it an inflammatory response? Is it a response to acidosis that we know you get from chloride? I don't know, uh, but I think it's provocative. And lots of people say, well, you can't give lactated ringers to the patient that has an elevated lactate. So here's your lactate levels in patients in my ICU with septic shock that got lactated ringers in the blue versus saline in the red. And the lactate levels actually are lower in the lactated ringers than in the saline, I think, because they're on less pressors. So I think those two are related um, and it's not anything other special than that. But if somebody says you can't give lactated ringers because this patient has a lactate of five and they're in shock, these data suggest that not only can you, but you may want to give lactated ringers to that patient. What about numbers? So here's the actual numbers for these patients, 5%, absolute reduction in death 
uh, for patients with septic shock, which if true, and the meta-analyses say it's probably true, but not this big, right? But if true, this would be the best treatment that we have for patients with septic shock uh, would be balanced fluids um, using those. All right, last thing, special population, renal failure. So this is another area where I don't have an answer, but I wonder, and I'm gonna try and be provocative with you. Here is renal failure at enrollment for SMART. So this isn't, did you develop renal failure five days down the road? This is when you got enrolled in SMART, what was your renal function? And you can see normal renal function, there's a, there's a little bit of balance, acute kidney injury, a little bit, chronic kidney disease, eh, maybe more towards the null, previous renal replacement. So these are dialysis patients that came to us and they got randomized based off of the month that they were in, the balance sort of saline. And if you got, sale, if you got balanced here, um, you had a 39% reduction compared to if, if you, a patient that got saline. The other thing I'll emphasize is the only way a dialysis patient can get a make 30 outcome is by dying. They don't get credit for doubling their creatinine and they don't get credit for new dialysis. So this is a 39% reduction in deaths. We've worked with our nephrologists to say, why is this? What is it? Um, and I don't know the answer, except that it looks like kidney when it doesn't work well, does not like chloride. Fluoride is not a good thing for the kidney when it doesn't work well. What about other data in this realm? Bicarb ICU trial, the last trial I'll walk you through. This was done by the French. Um, it looked at patients that had metabolic acidemia and randomized them to a bicarb infusion versus whatever the doctor wanted, which usually was saline, not balanced, but usually was saline. Almost 400 patients, you had to have a pH less than 7.2 and a serum bicarb less than 20 and you had to have a SOFA score above four or lactate. There's your two randomizations. This is a little bit more sodium chloride than, or sodium than you would give with D5W with three amps of sodium, of, uh, sodium bicarb, but on that range, similar to that, uh, versus fluids as usual. And their endpoint was death or organ failure. Here's their outcome. Uh, and you can see the top part is their overall population with no difference no statistically significant difference in mortality, renal failure, those things. The bottom is renal failure, which I think is actually quite uh, compelling. And that is if you had renal failure when you started and you got bicarb, you have a lower mortality than if you didn't. This is a subgroup of a randomized trial. So that should always make you say, eh, do I really believe that? Do I not believe that? But I think it's consistent with the, the subgroup in balanced fluids that had renal failure. And for us in our practice, these are the patients that we often, if they're acidotic and they have renal failure with their septic shock, I will resuscitate them with bicarb containing fluids. I think it probably needs to be replicated so that we know this for sure in a good study, but at least in clinical practice now, this is kind of what I've implemented into my practice. If they don't have renal failure, I use balanced fluids. If they do have renal failure uh, with their septic shock, I'll give them an amp or a liter or two of D5W with three amps of bicarb. Uh, as their resuscitation tool. Here's the renal replacement therapy. Again, lower in the group if they started with a acute kidney injury and got balanced and got bicarb, sorry, uh, compared to those that got the usual fluid. Not lower in the overall population. All right, summary, and then we'll see what questions you have. So initial fluid resuscitation of patients with septic shock still thought to be 30 mils per kilo, although it's based off of one single center study uh, and the evidence, uh, the, the robustness, the rigor of the evidence is being decreasing in the surviving sepsis guidelines. Fluids versus pressors in management after that initial resuscitation, I think pick your, pick your poison. I think it probably doesn't make a big effect on clinical outcomes and you can choose whatever you'd like. And you can choose different things in different patients. If you think this patient needs fluid and I want to give them fluid and that patient I'm scared to give fluid to, so I'm going to use pressors. I think that's perfectly fine too. Uh, using balanced crystalloids rather than saline likely prevents death. 89.5% posterior probability by Bayesian analysis in all critically ill patients. And I think the effect is larger in patients with sepsis uh, when balanced crystalloids, and especially if balanced crystalloids are given first. That first liter or two is balanced crystalloids. Uh, and we just talked about that. Tons of people involved in the research that we do. You can see some of them here. All their names are listed. It gets really long, but um, it takes a, it really does take a village to do some of these things. 
and I'm happy to see if I can clarify any confusion or answer any other questions. Thank you for your attention. Use the mic for questions since we got people on Zoom. Hi, um, I work in the clinical research office, so I have a question. I don't, we don't normally do cluster randomized studies. Yeah. And uh, I was just looking it up on your thing and then some other stuff. So, uh, how, do the patients get notified at least that they're a part of this or, or uh, in general, not just because of this study, in general with cluster yeah. stuff, do they get notified or, or do they, do we just do it like it's a retrospective study? Yeah, kind of maybe. Um, in SMART, they didn't get notified. SMART was done with a waiver of consent. The IRB said, and we, we gave our IRB data and showed them that it wasn't 50-50. Before we started in our ICUs, we used about 60% saline and 40% balanced. And we showed them that and said, depending on who your doctor is and which ICU you get sent to, you kind of randomly, haphazardly, arbitrary is the word we use, get one or the other of these. We would like to change that randomness, that arbitrariness to randomness uh, to do the trial. They said, we agree, this is minimal risk. It's impractical to consent every single critically ill patients. So they gave us a waiver and these patients didn't, didn't get notified. We've become smarter since then. That was 2017. We've become smarter since then. We still do a lot of clusters. We still do a lot of waiver. And now we notify patients that they're in a study. We don't get a consent for them to be in the study, but we tell them. Talking to the population at large, they actually think we do this all the time in, in medical care. They're like, what do you mean? Don't you guys like check and see what you're doing and see which is better and then change it? And we go, ha ha, that's funny. Like, yeah, of course we do. Yeah, of course we do. We wouldn't do anything different. And then we leave and go, wow, that was scary. Um, and they say, so we think you're doing that, but it'd be nice if we knew what you were studying and just tell us what you're interested in studying and studying. So in my ICU, there are signs that say, we are a learning healthcare system. That's a different talk for a different day, but we are a learning healthcare system. We are currently studying IV fluids. We do a ton of airway trials, innovation trials. So how to effectively put you on the ventilator, nutrition, whatever the trials are that we have waiver of consent. So there's a big sign. And then every participant gets a flyer in their room, either to their loved one or sitting at their bedside or whatever, that says the ICU is doing this study and you were enrolled in fluids or whatever. Uh, here's a number to call. We have very, very, very few people that call that are mad that they got enrolled. We do have some people who call who want more information about the trial. Tell us about it. What were you doing? You know, how can I help that sort of thing? Yeah, good question. That's great. Um, now, we know, now we know about that, we might be able to do some of those. Yeah. It's sometimes it's hard to get that through an IRB, but I am more than happy to talk to IRBs about how we've done it, which is often helpful in facilitating other IRBs to say, oh, we aren't like out on this very small limb all by ourselves and are going to get crushed by the OHRP. Um, so I'm happy to help. Thank you. Help. Quick question about uh, ringer lactate and shocked liver or yes. uh, liver failure. Yeah. Um, I don't know shock liver in general. We looked at cirrhotics, so chronic liver failure, not acute liver failure. Um, and uh, um, there's a, a um, abstract and then a manuscript in maybe critical care. I'm forgetting where it is. Looking specifically and smart at the cirrhotic patients and uh, balanced fluids were fine in that population. Uh, in that group, their lactate actually went up like 0 0.2 or something like that. So it, it technically goes up a little bit, but not enough that you clinically would recognize this patient's lactate. Yeah, that population is okay too. The, the one population, and I know this wasn't the talk, the one population you should, on boards questions or um, in clinical practice that you should not give balanced fluids to is TBI. I think as the data are coming out and we're getting more and more data, it's pretty clear that saline should be a fluid of choice in patients that have traumatic brain injury. It's fascinating to me because non-traumatic brain injury, like subarachnoid hemorrhages, ischemic strokes, et cetera, our preliminary look at the data suggests that balance may be better in that group, which is fascinating because if that's true, it means traumatic brain injury has different biology than non-traumatic <clears throat> brain injury. But that's not nearly as robust of a signal, and we aren't certain of that 
like we are TBI. TBI, if a patient comes in with trauma and has a brain injury and you need to resuscitate them with crystalloids, you should use saline all day, every day uh, in that population. Other questions? Uh, question about initial resuscitation in patients who have severe CHF or uh, ESRD patients. You know. Yeah. Um, the question was, if you guys didn't hear, resuscitation in patients that you're worried about giving too much volume to. So end-stage renal disease, heart failure, maybe a cirrhotic um, that might be volume overloaded. I, I think the answer there is we're not entirely sure. There are observational data that that have come out that say it's okay to give this 30 mils per kilo up front. It's observational data and it's fraught with confounders. You know, if you're a good clinician and you give 30 mils, sorry, I don't know what's going on with the mic there. Um, if you give 30 mils to the patient that you're comfortable can tolerate that and then they do okay, of course, it's going to look like that's okay. Uh, I personally am more cautious in that group they probably still get 30 mils per kilo, but it's probably not over three hours. It's probably six hours or nine hours by the time they, they end up getting it from you. Yeah, I think, I think it's a population that we need to prospectively study and figure out more. In. There's an article that just came out in critical care medicine that I'm actually not conflicted because I'm not on. That's that population in clovers that doesn't see any difference between the outcomes between the fluid group and the pressor group. But remember, clovers is not the initial resuscitation. All of those patients had already kind of gotten their initial resuscitation. So I think we still don't know for sure. The initial resuscitation. Best data we have says it's safe. Still makes me nervous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Rice, thanks for the talk. Um, my question is, um, for fluid resuscitation, what's your practice when it comes to using dynamic markers of fluid resuscitation? And yeah. if you do use them, what, what do you use? Um, we use them a little bit. Uh, we normally use uh, variants of IBC. So does your IBC collapse? Uh, we started doing a little passive leg raising, a little, but mostly we use uh, ultrasound of the IBC when we do it. Um, we used to do more of it. And then when I knew the results of clovers and classic, uh, I think I'm not sure fluids versus pressors matters. And so I'm much more agnostic to, you want to go from, you know, a little bit of norepi to a little bit plus of norepi, or do you want to go with another liter of fluid? And I'm like, pick one uh, from my standpoint. So we use it less now that we have those data, but if we're using it, it's mostly IBC. We don't, my institution, is uh, it hates art lines, probably too strong. I mean, not say it quite that strong. We don't use a lot of art lines. How's that? Is that better? Um, so pulse pressure variability that some people use isn't usually available for us very much because we put an art line in if the nurse comes to me and says, I don't, the blood pressure is like all over the place and I don't trust it. Or if the patient's on like truckloads of pressors, we'll put an art line in. But if the patient's on a moderate amount or less of pressors, uh, they probably don't have an art line. So I don't have that readily available for me, unfortunately. Well, we talked about it a little bit before the talk, but your thoughts on using lactated ringers in hyperkalemia for your yeah. septic hyperkalemic patients? Yeah, um, we, we do. We did look at this population. Uh, and if you have hyperkalemia, balanced fluids is better for you than saline. <coughs> Um, it's because of the acid base shift and the fact that saline will give you a little bit of a, or a lot, depending on how much you give, of a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. And then potassium shifts out of the cells and your potassium actually stays the same or goes up. Balanced fluids with hyperkalemia scares people because there's, depending on which balanced fluid, you get either four or five milliequivalents of potassium in it in the liter, but that's pretty small. And the benefit that you get on acid base offsets that. The population that it's really beneficial in is renal failure with hyper-K. And in that group, at least in SMART, balanced fluids got dialyzed less for hyperkalemia, dialyzed less in general and less for hyperkalemia than when saline was given to them. Yeah, so that doesn't keep us from giving balanced fluids. In fact, we prefer them in that 